going to talk a little bit about kind of the basics of options and options analytics. And what I'm talking about is kind of plain vanilla, your most basic equity options uh, using and valuing them using the Black-Scholes framework. I'm going to get into some of the Greeks, which you may have heard about, which are sensitivities, partial derivatives, and then talk about how to kind of use Python and Pandas to get real options data, apply some of these methods to your data frame, and do some math. So it's kind of a combination of mathematics, not as much as the previous talk, but a bit, uh, stochastic calculus, so a little bit of overlap there. Um, a lot of code and kind of some practicalities of trading options and how none of these models actually work in real life. So this is all on GitHub. Um, I'll, I'll post it on Twitter and I'll post it on the Meetup stream afterwards. Um, I've got some links down here, uh, a little bit of uh, an introduction to Python. Basically what I'm trying to say here is that Python is becoming quite a, an interesting tool in quantitative finance and quantitative analytics. I had a uh, professor who's a research director at a quant hedge fund in Chicago where I'm from and he used Python exclusively to price some very, very exotic and very um, interesting derivative contracts. You can actually find him on quant.stackoverflow.com. His name is Brian B. Uh, the man is absolute genius. So I'm kind of all over so you can stack. Uh, you can stalk me how you want. I do have one website which is essentially curated. Uh, curated resources for essentially deep learning, machine learning, and uh, finance that I post here. Uh, I won't go to there now, but uh, feel free to visit. So I, I built this in a Python notebook, um, and essentially just a walk through here, but a quick introduction myself. So clearly I'm uh, from the United States, or maybe not so clearly, but I am from the United States, and from Chicago, which is actually considered the derivatives capital of the country. Uh, the Black-Scholes formula, actually, people started trading that in Chicago. And I did a undergrad in finance, economics, and computer science. I have a graduate degree in quantitative finance, uh, which I got in Chicago. I worked for a hedge fund trading interest rate derivatives. I worked for BP and I worked for JP Morgan. And now I'm a CIO at a global agricultural trading firm here in Singapore. So I've kind of gone to the dark side, as some people call it, meaning I've gone to IT where actually being CIO has nothing to do with technology whatsoever. So I spend quite a bit of my free time coding and, and learning about um, all sorts of different things. So I'll start with some of the jargon. Uh, just raise your hands. How many know the basics of options? Call option, put option. Okay, about half. So they're called a derivative contract because they're based, their, their value is derived on an underlying security. So in this case, we're gonna be talking, the underlying is list of equity options, Apple, Google, et cetera. So call option is a derivative contract that conveys the right to buy the underlying security at a specific time in the case of a European option, which we're gonna be discussing here, so we can use the Black-Scholes framework to price them, um, at a specific price. The put option is exactly the opposite. So it conveys the right to the buyer to sell a security at a particular strike price at a specific time. You've got in, out, and at the money. So essentially, an in the money option is when, for a call option, the stock price is greater than the strike price, meaning that that contract is conveying value to you. Uh, out of the money is the opposite. At the money is when you're at about the same price. Implied volatility is actually something that's studied quite a bit. There's a lot of theories and papers about trying to forecast and predict implied volatility. It's, it's pretty much the most interesting thing you can think of when thinking of plain vanilla options. And when you are using the Black-Scholes framework, that's largely what you're doing, is actually computing implied volatility. And what that is, is essentially you're solving for a latent value. It doesn't actually exist. You're solving for that value using the model and the market option, the market price of the option. So you set those two equal, and you keep putting in different values of volatility until you, those are equal. And obviously you use something like a root finder for that. We'll get into that. So for the Black-Scholes formula, we'll talk about uh, some of the input parameters. It's actually unique in the history of options pricing in that there's only five underlying values. Uh, underlying stock price, the so-called strike price, time to expiration, the so-called risk-free rate. These four of which are actually observed in the market and this fifth, which is volatility. That's the volatility of the underlying stock price. So in layman's terms, you can kind of think of standard deviation of the stock price. That's one way to think about it, but the way that the stock moves through time, okay? You all know that you can flip a coin and Apple might go up, Apple might go down. 
Uh, there's various ways that people try to model how stocks move through time. Generally, it's Brownian motion, which is a, it's a stochastic process. That's how Black-Scholes does it. Um, but there's, there's various different ways. So we're going to get into some code. Um, essentially, just do my imports here. I'm going to be relying pretty heavily on Pandas, NumPy, and SciPy. And what we do is just declare each of these variables. So the five variables that we need, we, we take an underlying stock price. I basically create a vector of stock prices as well. Uh, yes? Give me the plug beagle. Yes. Perfect. Better. Okay, uh, and I'll see what this is doing. You'll see what this is doing later, this range, this vector. Uh, we've got the strike price. We've got this time to expiration. So what this is saying essentially is 164 days out of 365 days. So it's a fraction of the year. That's how the, the code is written. It takes a percentage of the year that's left to expiration. Expiration meaning then the contract goes away. Uh, this risk-free rate, so-called risk-free rate, 2%, which is actually like two basis points, um, but essentially we'll just use it so we can uh, just have some input. And then this kind of volatility figure, which is uh, 25%. So here are the versions. Uh, the most interesting thing here to note is I'm using uh, Pandas 17.1, or point 17.1. Uh, how many of you have not used Pandas before? Okay. Uh, very, very, very strong uh, time series. I mean, I've been using this since point zero 0.03. So to see where it's come from where it used to be is absolutely critical, incredible, but it's essentially time series. It's very similar to the R data frame. That's where it came from. Uh, it actually instantiates from NumPy, so it inherits a lot of NumPy's uh, of attributes, models, features, etc. Um, and then, of course, ubiquitous SciPy. So we talked about options. Um, essentially, you've got everybody using options from professional traders all the way down to retail traders. So professional traders are not trading these kind of plain vanilla options. They're trading what are generally called exotics. Uh, I've got a link here to the Wikipedia page. These include all sorts of different options that have all sorts of different features. Um, we'll see in a second what the payoffs look like, but essentially options are defined by the payoff, by the payoff function. Um, and the payoffs are generally actually pretty straightforward. So you'll see in a second what the actual Black-Scholes model looks like, which is not nearly as simple as this. Uh, but this is the payoff for an option that is priced by the Black-Scholes framework. So essentially what this is saying is that at the expiration of this product, uh, of this option, the value is the maximum of either the strike price minus, excuse me, stock price, underlying stock price minus strike price, which is either a positive value or a negative value. If it's positive, you take that number. If it's negative, you take zero. So essentially if the stock price is greater than your strike price at expiration, there's value. If not, it's valueless. It goes, expires worthless. A put option is essentially the same thing but backwards. So the value is when the stock price is underneath your strike price. The strike price is, remains constant the entire, uh, the entire lifetime of that option. Strike price moves. So as it moves at expiration, if the stock price is under the strike price at expiration, you've got value. Otherwise, it's zero. So this is easy, right? So why the big drama and why is Black Scholes so famous and all this? Well, it's not pricing the option at expiration, it's pricing the option before expiration. What's this option worth with 164 days left before it expires? We'll get to that in a second. So again, some code. So this is very simple. Uh, I created a Lambda function. So what I'm trying to do as well is kind of show some, some techniques in Python. So for those that are kind of beginner to intermediate in Python, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that some of these techniques will come in handy for you. Uh, those, of, those of you that are pros, it, it will look uh, just <coughs> out of routine. So a Lambda function is essentially an anonymous function. They exist in several languages. You can define it basically as a handler. I use handle because I'm from MATLAB, but uh, essentially you're assigning this function to this, uh, this handle. And this is actually equivalent to this. So if you define a function with two, two parameters, it just returns the element-wise maximum of these two values. This is this is exact same thing. Okay? And then we'll just plot it. So as you can see, and if you recall, I um, created that array of underlying stock prices, and that's for this purpose. So this was the, the low and this was the high. And what you can see here is that at expiration, at a strike price of 45, as the stock price increases, 
zero value up until that strike price, and then there's a linear payoff after, okay? So there's only a linear payoff after the strike price. Otherwise, this is a non-linear payoff function. And what you'll see is with Black-Scholes, it'll, it'll kind of fit into this so-called hockey stick. So you might have, I mean, this is called a lot of different things, a risk profile, a hockey stick, a payoff, p &L, all these different types of things. So this is the payoff. This is how much money the option is worth at expiration. And this is the stock price at expiration. So if the stock price is at 48 at expiration, the option is worth $3, which is 48 minus 45, okay? The put option is the exact opposite, so it's literally a mirror image. In fact, there's a relationship called put call parity that exists that you can derive the price of, of an option, a put option, using the call uh, underlying stock price and strike price. Uh, just a quick anecdote, in Chicago where they started trading these things in the 70s, um, you know, trading is supposed to have some economic value, right? There, the regulators could not imagine a way that a put option would have economic value. Why would you ever buy a contract basically betting that the stock would go down? So they banned sh uh, put options on the exchange and you could only trade call options. Well, you've got like PhDs down there, math PhDs and these incredibly brilliant people trading these options. So they essentially created a synthetic put option with this so-called put call parity. And that's how put call parity was, was essentially kind of made uh, popular other than the math, math, mathematics behind it. But people were actually able to trade a synthetic put option by using only call options and stock. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So what is this Black-Scholes options pricing model? So there's, there's kind of two things that you need to consider, and I absolutely will not read that. This is for your consumption or complete ignoring later. Um, essentially, there's two things that, that you have to think about. The Black-Scholes model itself is a framework that describes a market, okay? The actual pricing formula is derived from that market model, okay? So that's, that's kind of an important concept to understand. There are some assumptions that exist. So we're gonna talk about the actual model that describes the market first. And there are some assumptions that the rate of return is riskless, and we learned in 2007, 2008 that there are really no riskless assets. I worked at JP Morgan and I sat next to bond traders who were actually selling US government bonds at auction at minus one basis point. That means people were willing to lose money for the safety and security of US government bonds. That's clearly not a riskless security. And, and surely enough, a lot of the interest rate models that existed before 2000, 2008, 2007, 2008, went to poop afterwards. I almost swore, but I, I didn't. Um, the other, the other uh, assumption is that the instantaneous log return of the stock price is a random walk, so essentially that Brownian motion holds. There's this thing called the Hurst component, or the Hurst equation, I've heard it both ways. How many of you heard of the Hurst, H-U-R-S-T? That kind of measures if a time series is random walk or not, you can check that out. Oftentimes when you plug in uh, stock return data, uh, you'll find that it's um, essentially random. And the stock does not pay dividends. So there are adjustments to the Black-Scholes pricing formula that allow for dividends, but we will not discuss those here. Uh, so that's on the market. Uh, on the underlying security, there's no arbitrage opportunity, so there's no way to make a riskless profit. As we're seeing more and more with high-frequency trading, that may or may not actually be true. It's possible to borrow and lend at any amount, even a fractional amount, at that riskless rate. Uh, nobody in here can go borrow money at the rate that the U.S. government pays. So that's not actually true. Uh, it's possible to buy and sell any amount in even fractions of a stock. So clearly you cannot buy or sell fractions of stock. And in fact, uh, the government in the US, sorry, I keep going back to the US, but you know that's my frame of reference. Uh, in 2000, 2007 and eight, they banned short selling financial stocks. So that's not always true. And that transaction costs, uh, transactions do not incur costs, which is generally not true. There are some sites out there now that allow you to trade for free. But in general, that's not considered a truth. So essentially, what this model does, and I just scraped this from um, Wikipedia. Wikipedia does actually a pretty good job discussing Black Shoal, so I, I recommend you going out there. But it's the model basically says it's possible to create a hedged position consisting of, consisting of a long position in the stock and a short position in the option whose value will not depend on the price of the stock. So essentially, it, it, it describes a, a portfolio of assets, a money market, i.e. a bond, a stock, and some other thing 
that you can dynamically hedge through time. And that dynamic hedge is what makes the Black Scholes model a continuous model through time, is this aspect of continuous hedging. Uh, when I was in grad school, we actually proved that this could not be true with any amount of transaction cost and anything less than infinitesim infinitesimally small uh, rebalancings of your portfolio. So essentially, it's, it's, it's practically impossible to implement this model in real life because you cannot continuously trade at every millisecond that a stochastic or you know a differentiable equation allows you to do, a continuous equation, uh, nor can you do that for free. So a bit of the math, I promise it will not be that dense. Um, I won't derive the actual formula, but this is the model. So this model is what is used to, it's derived to come up with the actual pricing model. So this model describes a market which, given these assumptions I've just described, allows it possible to create a hedged position consisting of a long position in the stock and a short position in the option. So this is actually this, this market framework. This is what Black and Scholes came up with. Uh, another interesting anecdote on this, they, they try to publish their paper um, in some of the most prestigious finance journals of the time and uh, they didn't actually get accepted. So they, they got denied in publication. So they, they published their paper um, as a way to value employee stock options. That, that's the guise that they used to unleash this, this formula and this model on the world. And, and it was uh, published in some corporate liabilities uh, paper. So it's a, it's a very interesting story, um, if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, so nonetheless, the derivation is fairly long. Um, if you know stochastic calculus and you can apply Edo's lemma, it's not entirely difficult. Um, if you're rusty or you cannot, then it is very difficult. Uh, but nonetheless, you end up with something that looks like this. And while this is continuous, uh, this is a closed form solution. So this, this is an extremely important result because guys were on the trading floor with their like programmable calculators, valuing, valuing options. And these guys, the Black and Scholes, went to work for Goldman Sachs in the 70s, and they just, just destroyed the market because they had the best price. And through time, the traders on the floor were literally sitting on the floor with calculators, their programmable calculators, inputting the five parameters that you needed, coming up with the stock uh, of an option price that was better than anybody else's, and you just imagine how much money that they were making. So in short, um, this, is, this is all you really need to know, and this is very, very easily programmed in Python, which I'll show you, or any programming language for that matter. There's a website that, program, that shows you how to, how to program Black Shoals, I think in like 30 or 40 different programming languages, like the most archaic things you've never even heard of, like, um, God, I can't even think of one. I'm gonna say a name like COBOL, and some of the guys who have programmed in COBOL are gonna try to slap me afterwards, but if you haven't seen COBOL, I mean, COBOL is pretty, pretty tough, so if, if you're used to these high-level abstracted languages like Python. So nonetheless, uh, this is the formula. Uh, these are the uh, input parameters, and let's see it in code. So essentially this N, that's this, is a normal, normal cumulative density function. Um, and with that, you've got your Black-Scholes formula, which you could probably do in one line of code, uh, but I broke it into three for a little bit more readability. This should roughly follow uh, this up here. And by the way, this is latex as well. So if you grab, if you grab the notebook, you can double click and you can see how the latex works. I know you're asking about that. Uh, IPython notebooks, i.e. Jupyter, you can, it supports latex, clearly. So here's the Black Shell's call. Um, I don't agree with this, this doc string particularly, but that's how PyCharm does it, so I left it. Uh, and then the put value. So this is it. This is it. Literally six lines of code, and you can code up uh, call and puts. And you can see if you input some parameters, you get some numbers. So it's interesting to note here that if Back to our payoff function. If you had a, if you had a option at expiration that was worth three dollars, if you had a strike price of forty-five and you had a, a stock price of forty-eight, there's three dollars, right? But it's not three dollars. It's twenty. It's three twenty, right? And in the other way around, if you remember that the put option payoff, this should be zero, right? But it's two dollars and seventy-nine cents. And what this is called is time value. And what 
you know, it's described in many different ways, but essentially what that's doing is it's the optionality of your option. It's, it's the probability of the option actually finishing in the money. So there's value in that. There's an opportunity for that stock based on the volatility to increase over that strike price or decrease under that strike price. So that's, how, that's what the, the Greeks describe, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but it's just interesting to note. And what we'll see here is I basically created um, four arrays. I, so by the way, this is vectorized. So you can plug in an array of any one of these underlyings and you'll get the output as an array, which is very useful when doing this kind of stuff. Um, so basically what I did is I input this S underscore, which is that array of underlying stock prices. And I did six month expiration, three month expiration, one month expiration, and then at expiration. And I plotted them. And what you see here, this is the call option, is this is identical payoff function that we saw above. This is the value of the option with one month of time left, three months and 12 months of time, uh, six months of time left. And what you're seeing here is what I tried to just describe is the time value of the option. So this is why the Black-Scholes formula exists and why it's important, because it doesn't just give you a price at expiration, it gives you a price six months from expiration, okay? So that's why the Black-Scholes is important, and that's why a lot of these pricing models that the quants come up with are important, is because they give you the opportunity to price these things before the payoff actually hits, okay? So the Greeks are, I won't go through these, although they are extremely important, but this talk isn't, I don't want it to focus on the Greeks necessarily, uh, but they're essentially the partial derivatives of the pricing formula with respect to the inputs, okay? So V in this case is the value of the option. So the partial derivative of the value of the option with respect to the underlying stock price gives you delta. There's a different formula for calls and puts. The second partial of the value of the option with respect to the stock price, otherwise known as the convexity, if you ever studied bonds and bond pricing, uh, that's described this way. So that's basically how delta moves through time. Uh, vega, which is describes volatility, is how the stock, excuse me, how the option price moves with respect to changes in volatility. Uh, and then theta. So theta is exactly what you might expect, how the, how the option price moves with respect to time, and that's also called time decay. And then of course you have rho, which is the same thing with respect to the interest rate. Um, when interest rates are normalized higher than they are now, it's a little bit more interesting to see how options move with interest rates, especially when you're pricing bond options. Plain vanilla stock options, not so interesting, especially when interest rates are trading in like time basis points, okay? So then I could just go on and describe kind of what, what the input parameters are, okay? Same as before, we describe the Greeks in Python, so literally it's one line of code here. It's, it's so uh, beautiful, it's even kind of scary. So I think Einstein said elegance is for tailors, right? And when you're doing mathematics, that's, off, that's often the case, but sometimes you just can't deny beauty, right? Okay. <laughs> so again, I just print out some of these values. You can unit, you, you can unit test these. I actually unit test them, but I um, didn't commit the changes to GitHub, so I don't have them. I used uh, just a website called 888 Options. Uh, they weren't very interesting anyway, because I just had four decimals, and I just put this formula equals 5546, and it wasn't that interesting. But nonetheless, you can do that. Okay, so implied volatility. This is kind of where the, the meat of the talk is. Um, essentially, the Black-Scholes formula isn't usually used for pricing options. If you, if you were to trade using the Black-Scholes formula, you would lose money very quickly and then you would no longer be trading. So what it's usually used for is to extract this latent variable out of the market. So implied volatility is something that's estimated. It's an estimator. It has a range, uh, you know, statistical significance and a confidence interval, theoretically. Um, but people will use the Black-Scholes formula, take the actual market price, and extract out the volatility input parameter that we saw from above. And that's called implied volatility. It's the volatility implied by the market. And this is really where Black-Scholes is used. Uh, I do have a blog out there where I talk a lot about this stuff, and I implemented a very similar thing in C++. So what, what you can see the thing to learn in this blog post is how to integrate C++ models with Python. It's actually very easy. You have to look, uh, uh, write a little wrapper code, um, but it's, it's, it's very uh, interesting to see that. Um, I spent all this time 
uh, there's a numerical recipes book in C++, and I found the Brent, this Brent algorithm, and I spent all this time uh, modifying it for black shoals and for options pricing, and then I found out that the SciPy implementation is like exactly the same speed because it's actually the exact same model. So shame on me for not checking that first. But nonetheless, so we need to do uh, two things here. We need to create this objective function, and what this is is it takes the market price, so three dollars twenty cents uh, in the terms of the call, subtract it from the model price. Okay, so essentially what this is doing is if you put in an, if you put in a volatility of let's say 0.25, and you have some error here, that means that the market is not using the same volatility input parameter as you are. So essentially all we're doing is, is using this root finding algorithm to find what volatility input parameter do you need to set this error to zero, meaning that the Black-Scholes model price equals the market price, meaning that you have found the implied volatility, okay? So that's essentially what I'm, what I'm doing here. So you've got the objective function and then you've got this implied vol function, um, and really the, the money is this right here. One line. You put in your function, which is the objective function. You put in a lower bound and an upper bound, which is fairly easy because at some point you don't care if implied volatilities are like negative 5% because that's impossible, or way out to, sorry, 5, or way out to 5, which is 500%. Um, eventually you just cut, cut it off and then you interpolate, which I'll show you how to do. So essentially, I'll let you look through this. Um, I don't even know how much time I have to talk, but uh, I could talk about this for days, but um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So essentially, this is just kind of some, some coding, some al writing an algorithm on how to do this, but this is really the money right here. This is the, the method from SciPy that allows you to solve this objective function, okay? Same thing for the put, I just did it separately. Okay, and then what you can see here is Call implied volatility, if market and model were equal, it should be close to 0.25, and it is exactly 0.25. And, and the reason it's that is because I just took the, uh, I just took the, the actual model price and plugged it into the implied volatility formula. So the, the numbers were identical. So it's just a way to check it out. Okay, so that's a little bit of the theory and how to apply that theory in Python. So let's talk about getting data. Pandas. If you haven't seen Pandas, you need to go check it out like tonight. So Pandas has this interface on how to gather all these data. You can download stock data, you can download um, uh, economic data from the St. Louis, U.S. St. Louis Fed website. You can download Google Analytics data. You can interface with SQL databases. You can interface with uh, HF, uh, HDFS. You can interface with HF5 files, all sorts of different interfaces. Um, it's quite good. So to get the entire chunk of options that are trading for IBM, this is the code that, to do it. So you instantiate an object and then you call this method and then you've got this frame. This takes a while because it has to like literally scrape through every website. Uh, so you can pickle it and what pickling does is it essentially saves your data frame to an object, a flat file. Uh, it's very fast, very efficient, so I've just done that to show you how to do it. This is how you read the pickle. So you save the pickle and you read the pickle and then you've got identical data. So assuming that you don't want to have to go out to the network every time, or you want to test some things with the same data, you can do that very easily here, okay? So what does it look like? This is what it looks like. So these are the, uh, the attributes that we were able to pull down. It's a little bit over 53 uh, kilobytes. It's a, it's a multi-index, that's what it's called, and this is what it looks like when you print it out. So the strike, for each strike, there's a series of expirations. you got puts and calls. Um, I just took the top 10 results through the, or is that five, the top five, okay? So we're gonna do some work to clean this up. We're gonna remove percent change. We're gonna move Yahoo's version of implied volatility because of course ours is better. Uh, we're gonna rename some of these columns just because I'm weird like that. And then I'm going to uh, rename them and then re-index them. So essentially what this is doing is it's just what it looks like. It's renaming these columns and it's deleting these columns, okay? So we're gonna apply some functions. I'm gonna show you how to actually apply functions row-wise. So you take a row as an input to a function, and then you can do some stuff to that, that input and then output a value. I'm gonna show you how to do that. But first we have to kind of create these methods, and I'm just gonna fly by these quickly. 
what, what do we need to apply the Greeks, Black Scholes, and Plyde volatility? That's what we're trying to do. So we need the days until expiration. We need the fraction of time and years until expiration. We need the interest rate, and I've just made this really, I've just done this really cheap. I, I think these are the treasure rates and then these are the swap rates. Uh, in real life, there's a lot more nuance to creating a yield curve, uh, continuous yield curve. Um, but for, for argument's sake, we just use this. Um, essentially, I'm, in, I'm interpolating this. So this is every like month, right? 30 days, 90 days, 120 days, et cetera, uh, 180 days, et cetera. So what if an option falls at 137 days, okay? We're essentially building a yield curve, and then we're allowing ourselves to pick an interest rate anywhere on that yield curve. Uh, and I use the interpret, uh, interp uh, one-dimensional interpretation uh, interpolation method from SciPy. Uh, there's a 2D, there's a cubic spline, there's all sorts of different things you can do, but I just made it simple. Okay, get the mid price, which is the, it's the middle between the bid and ask. That's just the price, essentially. Okay, so this is how you do it. So I want to create a new column in my data frame, and I'm going to apply a function row-wise. That's it. So I do that four times, and then I have, you can see down here, my new columns, 519 non-null values. Days, time, interest rate, and mid. And then you can kind of see that out here, what that looks like. <coughs> okay, so a little bit under a half a year, a little bit over a year, et cetera. <coughs> okay, so implied volatility. So we go back to the same same uh, concept of applying uh, functions to, or mapping a function to a data frame row-wise. The thing to note here is that I'm, I'm kind of generically calling this function by a string. So I'm passing an option type, either call or put. This allows some dynamic nature to this method. And then I'm formatting, or excuse me, I'm, I'm actually creating a method named string. So this will be call implied volatility or put implied volatility, which is a string name of the function. And then I call that function against the globals. I think this is a dictionary. So globals are all the variables that are defined in your, in your namespace. You can use get, and then you call the method name, and you can apply your variable. So this is actually a really useful kind of bit of code. I use it quite often. So I'm going to apply, and I now have my applied volatility, and I will take a look at what it looks like, and there we go. So implied volatility at 0 0.45, 0 0.41, 0 0.33, 0 0.42. Those are all very, very reasonable numbers for implied volatility. I think I took these data yesterday. Stocks in the US in which IBM trades is, are absolutely tanking um, elsewhere as well. But specifically, IBM has, I think, come down like $15 on a $145 stock. So the volatility is elevated. Normal volatility range for this stock is a big blue chip stock, blue, big blue chip stock, maybe like 20 or 25. Percent, um, we're trading at around 40, 45 essentially for these options. You can see an NAN, NAN value, which I'll get to in a bit. So back in my interpolation function, I've, I've specifically cut out a whole range of different potential values for implied volatility. And the reason I want to do that is I want to show you how you can interpolate implied volatility. Professional traders will often do that. They'll take um, the most liquid points on a curve and they'll use that to create their own curve with some proprietary models. Uh, all I'm trying to do here is just prove the point. Uh, so you can see how many are, are actually uh, NAN, so a few. And the question is really why, right? So we're going to use some data science and kind of what used to be called quantitative analytics, but now the sexy thing is data science, uh, otherwise known as statistics, I think. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about data science in a second. Uh, but first, I've got this interpret implied volatility method, which essentially does all this fancy code that I could have broken out into 30 lines, but I didn't. Uh, but here, here's really what we're doing. Unstack is a way to create a pivot table. I'm interpolating the values, and then I'm forward filling and back filling. So you take the last value that you had. You can't, so extrapolation is where you go out further. Interpolation is when you have a series of numbers and there's a missing number in the middle. We're not extrapolating here, we're interpolating inside and then we're just taking the last value out and filling in the NANs. And, and all I did was just, I just wanted to demonstrate uh, these two methods because they're, they're pretty common when you're dealing with time series uh, data or other uh, panel data. So essentially all we did is fill in the NANs with some sort of linear interpolated data. Okay, so, and you can see that are, there's no more NANs, NANs. 
Okay, we follow the same thing and apply the Greeks. I'll skip this. I know you guys all want to hear about the data science. So uh, here we are. We're back to the theoretical value, the delta, gamma, vega, theta, rho, and model error. And you can see that we've applied each one of those to the data frame. So this is actually really powerful. I mean, 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago, uh, to be able to get an options chain like this, first of all, it was expensive. Second of all, you had to write it in a compiled language, not necessarily an interactive language. You could have probably done it in R. Uh, or even or even Python, uh, but not in one line of code. You could not get an options chain in one line of code. You could not apply implied volatility, you could not map an implied volatility method to 519 options, and it takes you know a few seconds, if that, uh, before. So this is very, very powerful stuff. Um, and then you can see I just print out the frame again. Okay, so data science. So we've got these model error, right? You'd expect that if we're using Black-Scholes to come up with implied volatility, and then plugging implied volatility back into the model, we would expect that there would be no model error. The, the mid price that's in the market would be the same as the model that we're coming up with. That's largely true, but not entirely. So a lot of zeros, but there are a few that aren't zero. So this is 50 cents, that's a dollar, that's one and a half dollars. So there's some fairly significant model errors here. So we have to form a hypothesis on why we think these model, model uh, errors exist, and then investigate those. We're not gonna do it statistically rigorously, meaning that we're not gonna do like statistical uh, significance or anything like that, but we still wanna walk through the steps. Okay, so basically what I'm doing here is um, a few things. So I'm, I'm, first of all, mapping the absolute value uh, method to the model error to just make it static, or the absolute value, uh, then I'm sorting. So I, all I want is the top 50 errors. And then I want the, the top largest by strike, because what I think is going on is that way out of the money options are giving us big model errors because the market makers get that bid ask spread very wide so that you have to pay up for that option. I know that a lot of that probably doesn't make any sense to you, um, but we have a hypothesis, I guess is my point. And what I think is way out of the money strikes are creating model error. So I want to test that. So indeed, I do some fancy stuff here with Python, and I can see, I know it's hard to read, but the at the money strike is about here. There's no error, right? All our error occurs down here where we're way out of the money. So 115, 110, 100, et cetera. So this is evidence to suggest that I'm correct. My hypothesis is correct, that the model error appears in out of the money strikes, and indeed it looks, could be following some sort of a linear relationship as well. Probably be pretty weak, but nonetheless, you can probably see it. Okay, so again, my hypothesis also is the wider the bid ask spread, the more the, mo the more the model error. Essentially, what happens is the farther out of the money you are, and I talk about this here. I talk about all this here, so you can just read it and you'll find out. The 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 wider the uh, excuse me, the farther out of the money the strikes are, the wider the bid ask spread. So it's kind of the same. It's kind of doing the same thing, but nonetheless, you can see spreads should be like 10, 15, 20 cents. Okay, three dollars, four dollars, four fifty, five dollars. So we're getting model errors that are quite big when we get out to very wide bid ask spreads. Okay, so this is some this is data sciencing this kind of stuff. And then you know just because we all like scatter plots, I plotted a scatter plot, and there's not enough. Uh, obviously, there's not enough samples here to make any conclusive remarks, but you can see visually, you can kind of fake it and say that there's probably a linear relation between model error and bid ask spread. So as the model error gets larger, the bed ask spread is also getting larger, okay? Of course, correlation is not always causation, but in this case, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, so then we'll look at implied volatility, which is actually the title of the talk. So this is this famous implied volatility skew. Uh, if you can talk about implied volatility skew at the pub, then you're generally considered kind of in the know. Um, and you often see shapes like this. This is actually called more like a smile. Uh, I just call everything askew. But essentially what you're seeing here is a, is a direct violation of the assumptions in the Black-Scholes model in the, in the framework. It assumes a, a constant volatility. Clearly there's not a constant volatility across strikes. Okay? This is very clear. Uh, so this violates the Black-Scholes model. Um, this is why you don't trade the Black-Scholes model. Because if you use this volatility and you plug it into the Black-Scholes model, uh, and the volatility should be somewhere else, uh, somebody will pick you off and you will lose money. So the actual at the money strikes are around here, 
So we see that at higher strikes, there's a lot less volatility. Another way to think of implied volatility is kind of, is kind of the lever that people use to increase or decrease the price of an option, all else held equal. So if you hold all the input parameters equal and you increase the implied volatility, the option will become much more valuable and vice versa. So you can see that people are thinking that options around these strikes are, are not that valuable at the moment. Nobody's buying call options at these strikes when there's intense volatility in the market and the stock is trading here. That's kind of what this is showing here. This is actually quite a phenomenon. This was not observed in the market until after the 1987 market crash in October in, two, in, in the US. There's a Black Monday, uh, there was a market crash, and this, this skew, if you will, in the term structure, which we'll see in a second, actually didn't exist before that. I think after that, when people got uh, their face ripped off, which is a saying in finance, when you lose a lot of money, um, they started rethinking how options should be priced and repricing options. And it's actually it's a, it's a pretty incredible phenomenon. Just imagine you sitting there one week and it's flat skew and then two weeks later there's this giant curve and you keep seeing that over and over and over again. Um, that's what kind of researchers really get excited about is, is finding this stuff in the market. Uh, and then we build the so-called, uh, well this is just a multi, multi, uh, excuse me, multi expiration skew. So these just represent different expirations, okay? So you can see that way far out, so this is like two years from now, over two years from now, the expiration, very low volatility. Because people think that in time, volatility will subside and they're pricing these options very low. So there's not much demand for these options straight out. And you can see as the time gets smaller, the volatility gets higher because it's, it's, it's right now. I need this right now. Okay, and the so-called term structure volatility. Uh, again, it's not constant clearly. So you see there's extremely high volatility. This might actually be because there's like only a very, very few days left on these options and this will go essentially to infinity when expiration goes to zero. Um, but you can see that it, it generally flattens out and this also could be a, a function of the interpolation that we did. But you can see there's a curve. This is called the term structure and this tells traders things as well. Essentially, it's, it's like the, the forward markets, uh, excuse me, it's, it's the, uh, the curves, backwardization, and contango in the futures markets, if you're familiar with that. Uh, it kind of helps understand where the demand is uh, across time and how much it costs to carry such an option or, or a future. But in this case, it's, it's more of the demand. Okay, and lastly, just because I can, I plotted a 3D surface, which just looks like a blob of nothing. Uh, but this is actually, and it's not even that useful to be honest with you, it's, just, it's very famous. Everybody loves a volatility surface. Um, and for, for us, right, for retail kind of traders, it, it doesn't do anything for us. Professional traders, it, it does, and I'll explain in a second. You got days to expiration, strike price, and implied volatility. And not only does this not tell us anything, but it's like almost impossible to read because it doesn't have grids. <laughs> so I, my, my, the point of doing it is just to show you that you can. So I use this, this cool mesh grid function and, and kind of uh, uh, you can just look at the code and figure out how to do it. So what, what people will actually do with the surface is if, if I have an option that I'm, I'm creating by scratch, right? So it's not a standardized option that trades on an exchange. Somebody calls me and says, I've got this terrible financial problem. I need an option to hedge my risk. But I need it at... 462 day expiration and a $141.36 strike price, which doesn't exist. What I do is I create a surface and I'll create models that will basically make this very smooth at every penny. And what I can do is I can, I can go and say, okay, 442, 142, here's your implied volatility. I've used this surface, it's called calibration. I'm, I'm calibrating this option that you want to the surface that I built that is generally observed in the market. So that's how the surface is actually used. It's used to price other options. You don't just sit and look at it and make like these brilliant trading decisions. You use it for pricing other options. So that's what the surface is for. Okay, uh, any questions? Yes? You completed your presentation? I did. It's <laughs> <laughs> a very uh, ignorant question. Uh -huh. I always wanted this option thing, right? If the option is in the money, does it mean that the seller of the option is the loser and vice versa? Yes. If, if you are a buyer of a call option and that option is in the money, you have the, op, you have the right but not the obligation 
to buy that option yeah. at the strike price. Okay? If you're the seller, you are obligated to sell your stock at the strike price. So, so yes, you are correct. If you sold me a call option and it's in the money, you lose. Doesn't it mean that both, both parties are betting against different directions? Yes. That, that's a fundamental aspect of the markets is that you have to have people that are willing to take either side of the market to provide what's called liquidity so that anybody can come in with any trading decision they want and get the security that they're looking for. And the other piece that we didn't talk about at all is that you, you can combine options to create what's called complex options positions. So you can, one of the, what are the powers of options? I'm going way deeper than your question. Apologies, but I just can't stop sometimes. One of, the, one of the important things of options is that you can control your risk profile. You know exactly what you can lose and exactly what you can make at any time, okay? So just because you've sold me the option doesn't mean that you're not hedged somewhere else, and it doesn't mean that you don't own another option to offset that as well. Yeah, but doesn't mean that both parties that are using mathematics, they are diametrically opposite pointing? Well, they're using, they're using mathematics to come up with what they think the value of that option is. So there's a funda fundamental assumption underlying this, which is uh, this is what they call arbitrage free price. So for every winner, there has to be a loser. That's the implication. So I guess the way to go about doing this is to manipulate the price at the uh, expiration date. I'll never say manipulate. <laughs> um, that's you're not you're absolutely right? correct. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> no we see in Singapore, right? The authorities plan down. The market's basically flat. No, nobody's doing any trading. Right, and, and exactly. So I know your currency, uh, your currency doesn't move much, right? And l the lack of volatility in a market is the bane of any trader. No, no. I used to trade, and I didn't even come to work because the bonds would trade in five tick spreads, and I would just sit to be. All day, so I just leave. So, so you're exactly right. And I should have prefaced this with don't try this at home because it's, it's not a simple kind of thing. But, but you're fundamentally right. So if you sell me an option and you don't have any, if that's the only thing that you've done, you actually have infinite risk. Because if you've sold me an option, meaning that you are obligated to sell me that stock at $50, okay? Let's say the stock price goes to $500 and you don't own that stock. You have to go buy that stock at the market at $500 and you are obligated to sell it to me at 50. If that stock goes to 1,000, if that stock goes to infinite amount. So in a theoretical sense, if you have what you're describing is selling a naked call option, you have infinite risk, which is why brokerages generally do not let you do it. Okay. The other thing to realize is that not only does this formula allow you to price the option, but allows you to hedge the option. The delta function and the gamma function essentially price your risk at a point in time ahead of, ahead of expiring. So that's, that's a, it's the dynamic hedging that makes this extraordinary. All right? It gives you an arbitrage free price, but it also allows you to hedge your option position, to hedge that risk. Yep. And there's cool things called like gamma scalping and gamma delta hedging and vega trading and all these really fancy sounding things that are exactly how he describes. So you can, you can use these parameters to hedge away 89 or 80% of the risk of an option and only be exposed to the part of the option that you want. This is a very, very powerful tool if you use it correctly. And we are literally just scratching the surface. I mean, this is a fairly broad introduction, but it's not very deep. It's just kind of the basics. Hull and White, their, their options and derivatives and swaps, or whatever that book's called, that's kind of the Bible. Uh, if you Google Hull and White, anybody help you with the name? Yeah, it's, uh, I'm just right uh, I always forget the, uh, <laughs> it's like swaps, options, and economic, uh, There it is. Futures, options, and other derivatives. This is the this is the uh, the book to read. Covers well options, futures, and other derivatives. Any anything else? Yes. So if the market is very volatile, I mean that that came from my personal experience.
So buying both call and put at the same time will be beneficial. Well, if you buy a call and a put, that's called strat, right? Yeah. So, so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, let's say market is at 100. So if you buy put for 90 and call for 110, so if the market is really volatile, that will, I mean, surely give you some return. Could it, it could right? So what you're describing is 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 basically composing complex option positions. So you can combine different types of options, the different strikes and different expirations, to basically design the risk profile that you want. So I don't know what buying a, a one one hundred call and a one ten. You could do a ninety one ten strike. Could be yeah. Could be. But but what you'll see is literally um, this payoff. Will look different. So a straddle would be like this, and what you're essentially doing is betting, or sorry, the other this. Way. Yeah, you're betting on volatility, meaning that you're betting that the stock will either go way up or way down. But so you're not even exposed <coughs> to the underlying; you're exposed to the volatility of the underlying. So that's another example of why options are powerful. Equally, equally, if the market's really volatile, everyone in the market selling the option knows it's volatile, yep. so they pump the price up. Just to the point that, on average, no one wins or loses. It's exactly. a kind of efficient market. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So the, the trick in what professional options traders will do is they'll have their own volatility models. They think that their model is better than the next guy's model, and when they plug in their when they plug in their volatility metric, they will get a better price that's more reflective of reality. So if they plug in their if if they think implied vol is twenty percent, the market is implying a twenty five percent, then that option is going to be underpriced. So they will take a bet on their model, and they will buy that security, in or sorry, sell that security in anticipation of the market volatility coming down, meaning that they think their model is better than the market, and the market will eventually revert to what their model says. So you had one. Uh, uh, are you uh, writing a script to do all your trading automatically, or are you doing it, are, are you doing it manually? I've, I've done both, so um, I think trading, discretionary trading, is a loser's game. You'll never, you'll never win, uh, especially when you have a day job. Uh, so what you can do is you can create models that will trade for you. Um, doing that in the options market is extremely difficult. So I've never actually traded live money, uh, but there's you know a site called Quantopian. We've heard of Quantopian. Quantopian allows you to build stock trading models, back test them in uh, Python. It's actually pretty incredible. Uh, Interactive Brokers has a an API that you can connect to, and you can you can set any order that you want to the market. And actually, <coughs> Quantopian, you can trade against your inter Interactive Brokers account as well. Um, you mentioned a few times uh, about like for the for the surface and, and how uh, generally traders build their own models on top of that because I mean this is fairly basic and then people get more um, I'm just wondering conceptually what what, what 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 point are they trying to get to? Well they're they're trying to so a couple things. It depends on the on the purpose, right? So if like this description here sorry if this is like making you sick. Um, so the the example I described here was that they build a surface to price other options. So this would be an investment bank selling complex derivatives to a, a an institution, right? Big money trades, hundred million dollar notional values, things like that. That that's one example of why they're trying to build a model so that they can price other derivatives correctly, and that's important. Or they can get a better price for the same derivative than the other guy. So Goldman wants to sell you something. So does UBS. Well, if UBS is a more accurate volatility model, that that price is lower. You're going to buy that product from UBS, okay? The other reason is is for proprietary trading. So if um, so, I use a very simple interpolation. I've got down here in the references section this article from NAG Numerical Algorithms Group, um, and they did a they used their proprietary uh, numerical algorithms library, which is actually very expensive. You can get a sample, you can get a, a demo version, but. And they did exactly what I did. Only use they use a much more sophisticated method of smoothing the curve. And in that case, if you think your model is better than the next guy, then you will trade using your input volatility, your volatility input, and you'll trade on the difference between the price and the market. 
and that, that's how professional traders do it. They're not going to buy a call option with the hope that Apple goes up. They're going to they're going to do what I just showed you on a much just a much more sophisticated level. Uh, another one? Yes. Is it true that all, all these models is, is built based on backward-looking data? So uh, you, you have to train the model using existing data, with a past time series. Actually, no. This, if you look at the model, um, this one particularly, uh, it's completely independent of any past data. It has five input parameters and that's it. So there's actually no training whatsoever. And that's another beauty of the model is that you don't need any historic data. It's a completely closed form. But the volatility and all is depend as well as the underlying and you know, the coefficients will come from somewhere, right? You're right. So the past behavior of the underlying. Yes, the volatility the volatility is generally estimated as a standard deviation of log returns. So you're absolutely right. If you're using a very naive way to estimate an underlying's volatility, you take two hundred and fifty two uh, returns, you take the log of that, and then you take the standard deviation and that you multiply it by a square root of 252. And that square root of 252 actually comes from Black-Scholes. But, um, but you're right. But that's only one way to estimate volatility. With, with the model, the model assumes kind of the, what the future looks like. So the model assumes a, a geometric Brownian motion of the stock going forward. It, that's just an assumption. Did that answer? You can plug whatever volatility you want to plug in. So like if, if you know you estimate historic volatility at twenty percent and you think you know IBM is gonna go for a burden or go to the roof, then you plug thirty in and that tells you the if the market price then is cheaper than the price you're getting from your model, how long as you buy it. That's literally what I did. I just plugged volatility 0.25. There's literally no reason I used two five, I just used it. But you're right, it's just one method of estimating volatility and generally Volatility estimators are based on historic data, and this—if you do that, I mean, it's an estimator, right? It's got its confidence level, it's got its statistical significance. So there's issues with this, um, which is why it's not generally used. You usually use the model to imply the volatility from the market. Did that answer the question? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so, so you can like plug in anything you want, like GDP or weather. Yeah. I mean, there's got to be an economic foundation to why you're using that number, right? You, you probably wouldn't put in like 34 degrees for an implied volatility number that takes, you know, you know what I mean? Like you have to have some sort of uh, economic foundation onto why you're using that, which is why you generally use that standard deviation number because it's, it's easy to understand. It's generally accepted as a risk measure for the underlying stock movements. So did you say that the underlying assumption is that the price uh, movement is a Brownian motion? Yeah. The, the model assumes that, yeah. So as in science, it moves randomly around? Yeah. yeah. That's what you mean. With, with a drift and a volatility. So if you think of, um, you know, the Wiener process, right? So that's just no drift, no volatility. Geometric Brownian motion kind of extends the Wiener process and it adds a drift, meaning that it's got some average, meaning that it kind of on average goes up or average goes down. That's what drift is defined as and some sigma or volatility parameter dictating how tall, you know, how big the spikes are. But of course, real stock price is determined partly by the financial forecast and the actual results. Yep. And whatever market manipulation and uh, the economic, the macroeconomic things that's yep. going around. You're absolutely right. So the model clearly does not capture all that. But that's, that's a model, right? So the financial models cannot capture all that. They're, they're mathematical models. And like I mentioned earlier, there, there are other processes. There's a jump to fusion process that assumes that there's some probability of the stock jumping at some point in time. Uh, it uses a Poisson distribution. That's actually a little bit better because it, stocks do jump. They gap up, they gap down. So that's another model that you can use to model stock prices. But you are, you're nailing it. You're absolutely correct. It does not capture the reality, which is true of any financial model. Which is actually why machine learning is becoming much more compelling for pricing these things. That's, that's becoming, as you can imagine, kind of a hot topic. There was a hedge fund, I think, that was trading simply on sentiment from Twitter. Uh, it blew up, but nonetheless, it tried. <laughs> I, think it, I think it made money for like six months. Um, 
and, and it was significantly different than random. So it actually had some significance, meaning that it was actually able to glean some information from Twitter. Is that um, single? No, I don't think it was single. It, it's, oh. it goes back. It was, it was probably five years ago. Oh, well, this, uh, this Russian in Singapore, he said that he, he was trolling that with, uh, with a customer. Hmm. Using social media to give trading directions for H fund. Yeah. I mean, okay. it's happening. Blo the Bloomberg Professional Service has has that. Um, I went to a talk in London from a guy, the, the head uh, data science or the, the head machine learning researcher from Bloomberg, uh, and he's trying to crack sentiment analysis. And he said it's extremely difficult for well, predictions. Sure my professional okay. would be sharing their trading directions on social media <laughs> unless they want to influence the market. It's open source, man. <laughs> <laughs> open source sharing ideas. Actually, the best algorithm for that, I think, is here in Singapore instead of any US. Yeah. It's pretty hard. Okay. So, uh, it's not so bad. Interesting. Talk to this guy. <laughs> the, the truth is, very, very few trading algorithms actually make, make money. That's why a lot of them share. Anything else, guys? Yes? Is the volatility of the stock affected by the percentage of shares that are actively traded, like short on the market? Because I imagine out of 100%, not all of them are actually changing hands frequently. Yeah, I would imagine. I, I don't. I can't say I've got empirical evidence to support that, but I, I certainly think they do. So usually, the fewer shares that are outstanding, the less liquid, meaning the fewer people are trading, and the less liquid the stock, the more you're going to see it jump. And that that's usually true of smaller smaller stocks. They'll have fewer shares outstanding, fewer trades per day, and that'll that'll contribute to the increased volatility. And then those options will become much more expensive. Would they be covered by this model, or would you have to model that separately? No, it would. So what you could do is come up with this value here, the volatility parameter. Uh, and this, instead of, I can't type in here, but maybe instead of 0.25, you might have 0.5, or 0.75, or 1.25. And that's how you would incorporate that information into the model. OK, any more questions? You have a few more hours before the U.S. stock market. <laughs> Get your counsel. Okay. And what kind of <laughs> uh, Thank you very much, Jason, My for pleasure. the uh, presentation. So two more. Uh,